Good morning, everyone. I am Council Member Fernando Cabrera, and I'm Chair of the Juvenile Justice Committee. To, during today's oversight hearing, we'll be examining the city's reentry programs for formerly incarcerated youth. I want to thank you all who are here today to discuss this important area of our city's juvenile justice system. One of our primary issues that our juvenile justice system must confront is how best to prevent the re occurrence of antisocial and unlawful behavior upon juveniles released from detention back into society, into society. Because juveniles are by nature particularly vulnerable to stress and peer pressure, and unless they are equipped with adequate support networks, it is relatively easy for them to last back into the old habits that resulted in the original arrest. Lack of proper uh, follow-up care, follow-up, care, support, and planning during the reintegration process greatly increases the likelihood of youth relapsing into illegal, antisocial, and addictive behaviors. Thus, it makes sense for both the juvenile and for society to put time, resources, genuine commitment into the rehabilitation process. Recognizing that a comprehensive, uh, comprehensive aftercare model is essential to the commitment of juvenile rehabilitation, aftercare programs and strategy have been developed and implemented across the nation, and today I consider an essential component to juvenile justice systems efforts to reduce recidivism and maintain rehabilitative progress after release from juvenile detention. A comprehensive aftercare program daily begins during incarceration and includes providing an evaluation counseling, education, therapy, and services to prepare a detained or place juvenile for successful reintegration into his or her community. It is critical to long-lasting success that juveniles are then linked to organizations within their own communities for their continuing intervention and supervision lasting well after the release from detention. Today, we look forward to learning in, in greater detail about the reentry planning and the continuum of aftercare program that DYFJ is providing to young people detained and placed in its custody, as well as how the Close to Home Initiative has brought about a more seamless reentry process and better aftercare services for you following detention and placement. With that said, I want to thank my staff for helping put in this hearing, and thank you all the council members in attendance here including uh, Barry Grodanchik has joined us. We look forward to hearing testimony from representatives, representatives of DYFJ, as well as an advocate and nonprofit that has signed up to testify. I will now kindly ask for the representative of the administration to please state the name for the record so that the committee <coughs> council can administer the oath. Uh, you first, do you be firm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions. I do. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Cabrera and members of the committee on juvenile justice. I'm Felipe Franco, Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Youth and Family Justice within the Administration for Children's Services. With me today is John Dixon, Associate Commissioner for the ACS Close to Home Initiative and Senior Executive Director Marinacci from the New York City Department of Education, District 79. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. We look forward to discussing with you the services and supports that the Division of Youth and Family Justice provides for youth as they transition back to their communities from juvenile justice placement. As you know, the Division of Youth and Family Justice oversees services and programs for youth at every stage of the juvenile justice process. Our continuum includes community-based preventive and alternative services for youth who are at risk of delinquency and their families. And we provide detention services for youth who are arrested and waiting court resolution. Since 2012, we have been providing residential services for the New York City youth placed with ACS as adjudicated juvenile delinquents by the family court. These placements include oversight of youth reentry and aftercare services, as well op as supervision upon return to the community. Typically, 
youth first encountered the juvenile justice system as a result of, a, of an arrest or due to a warrant. Currently, a young person between the ages of 7 and 15 who commits a crime is considered a juvenile delinquent, and he and he and his or her case is heard in the family court. Depending on the time of the day that the arrest occurs, the youth will immediately be taken to court or to a secure detention facility until court is in session. In court, the judge assesses the allegations, the, likeli the likelihood the youth will commit another offense, and the likelihood that the youth will return to court on the next scheduled adjourned date. And based on the assessment, Deter determines whether to release, to release the young person or remand the youth to detention. When a young person is remanded to detention, the judge reassesses the need for detention each time the youth appears in court. Because of this, and the faster pace of family court proceeding, detention length, length of stay for juvenile delinquents is relatively short, around 33 days, with most youth leaving detention within 10 days. Dispositions on family court delinquency cases may include treatment, probation, restitution, conditional discharge, or placement. A family court judge may order a youth to be placed in a residential placement program if the judge finds that the youth committed an offense and is in need of rehabilitation services. The family court generally places youth in close to home for 12 to or 18 months periods. Youth are initially placed in a small group home setting, style residence, usually around six to 18 beds, at sites throughout the city, with are run by seven non-for-profit provider agencies. They are re there, they receive approximately six to nine months of intensive therapeutic programming based on their length of placement as ordered by the family court and their individualized needs before returning to the community on aftercare. Youth behavior, level of participation, and personal growth while in placement are key factors in determining a date for the release to aftercare. In addition, youth participate in community passes and home visits while in residential placement, allowing the Division of Youth and Family Justice and provider staff to observe and assess the youth and their family readiness for reunification. Planning for reentry begins on the very first day of a young person placement in close to home and continues for the entire duration of the youth residential placement as, and as they transition to aftercare in the community. Once the family court places a young person in close to home, a Division of Youth and Family Justice Placement and Permanency Specialist, a PPS, is immediately assigned to the youth and continues to work with that youth and their family throughout their time in close to home. The PPS ensures that the youth needs are being addressed throughout the appropriate services and maintains regular contact with the youth while they are in residential placement. Subsequent aftercare supervision by the PPS allows the worker to help and encourage young people to participate <coughs> and enhance the skills they learn while in placement so that the youth may successfully remain home while in the f with, with their families. Close to Home uses the ACS practice of family team conferencing as a means to effectively plan for youth and to ensure that, that ACS and contractor providers respond appropriately to youth behavior and circumstances. Conference Facilitation Specialist, CFS, convene planning and support meetings at six critical transition points for the youth and ensures that the youth, their family, and all other relevant stakeholders are present. CFS also convenes emergent team conferences when the youth are not compliant with expectations and ensures that all the necessary parties are involved to determine appropriate next steps. <coughs> After residential placement, most youth, young people, return to their home communities on aftercare, where youth and their families continue to receive intensive support from the assigned PPS, as well as individually determined aftercare resources for the remainder of their placement period. The goal of close to home aftercare is to build on the skills youth acquire while in placement and help develop a network of support 
that will allow them to succeed in the community. All of our young people and their families are considered for evidence-based in-home services, such as functional family therapy, FFT, and multisystemic therapy, MST. These services begin when the youth is still in residential placement and are designed to support the family during the youth transition home. Clinical staff work with the families and youth to facilitate joint understanding of issues and work to ensure the positive ongoing patterns of communication are established and maintained at the home. In addition, youth participate in employment programs in partnership with the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development, DYCD, as well as targeted gun, gun prevention services through the Cure Violence Initiative made possible through the funding from the New York City Council. The Cure Violence Adaptation for Close to Home currently consists of only one provider per borough. Cure Violence providers connect with youth while they have, who have a history of gun possession or, gun, or gang participation. They engage youth in residential placement throughout workshops and individual meetings and support youth as they re-enter the community. Cure Violence staff challenge youth thinking and serve as positive, credible role models providing youth with an alternative to violence and gang-involved life. In the five years since Close to Home began, we have seen that the success of a young person's reintegration into the community rests largely on the strength of the support they receive while in aftercare. With this in mind, we are focusing on a number of enhancements to our aftercare program to improve outcomes for youth, justice-involved youth and bolster public safety. These enhancements focus on improving youth monitoring and accountability, enhancing oversight of staff and providers, and increasing interagency partnerships. Close to Home recently implemented a new graduated response protocol for youth in aftercare, which was developed in partnership with the Center for Children Law and Policy. This protocol uses a series of accountability-based incentives and sanctions to encourage better decision making and compliance with aftercare requirements. And to promote continuity of care, create a tighter network of supervision and ensure that youth are held accountable for their actions. Close to home, NSP providers will build up on already established positive relationship with youth and retain responsibility for youth as they transition from placement to aftercare an effective practice already in place for youth in close to home LSP. Based on juvenile justice based practices, close to home is implementing a risk need responsivity framework with support from two national recognized experts in the field, Dr. Dina Vincent and Dr. Deborah Kossel. As part of this implement implementation, close to home is partnering with the New York City Department of Probation using their assessment tool, the YLS, to align case practice for jointly served youth and families. The risk need responsivity use of a validated risk and need assessment <coughs> to drive case planning and ensure that services are based on the youth assess needs. The result of this effort will be that youth will receive individually designed service plans with target behaviors that are likely to result is subsequent criminal activity. For example, youth, who are, who, youth with negative peer relationships or who struggle with to appropriately secure their leisure time to structure the leisure time will be connected to community-based organizations such as the YMCA and Boys and Girls Clubs where they can participate in constructive youth development activities with positive peers. Similarly, youth with family relationships or partnering needs, parenting needs, will be connected to evidence-based services, as I mentioned before, like MST or FFT, and youth with educational or vocational needs will receive services specifically tailored to support their success in school and work. The Division of Youth and Family Justice recognizes the importance of collaboration, collaborating with families, and that is why Close to Home is expanding family team conferencing to ensure collaborative planning is in place for all youth and families at all critical pro program transitions and when youth are not following established expectations. 
New York City Juvenile Justice System encompass multiple city agencies, including the Department of Probation, the, the DYCD, and the New York City Police Department, and the Law de Department, and the Department of Education. Improving communication and consistency of practice across these many agencies is critical to create a citywide juvenile justice continuum for core involved youth. We are actively working with our sister agencies to enhance information sharing, family engagement, and strengthen case planning and management, and create new training opportunities to elevate the competencies, skills, and knowledge among the staff, bolster educational support for youth as they return to the community. In closing, thanks for the opportunity to discuss the Division of Youth and Family Justice Aftercare Services, as well as the supports that we, our provider partners, and our sister agencies provide for youth and their families in the community. We constantly strive to improve outcomes for justice involved youth, and we are confident that the enhancements that we have set in motion for, after, after, for our aftercare program will yield positive results as the city enters a new phase of juvenile justice with the implementation of Race to Age. As always, we're happy to work with the committee in our continued efforts to improve the system and services for the city juvenile justice involved youth and their families. We're happy to take your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. I want to thank you, as always, uh, for your openness and willingness uh, to work with the Council and also with advocates and be able to uh, implement very innovative ideas. Uh, we just recently met uh, for more innovative ideas uh, to be implemented. So I'm really, really, really pleased. I have a few questions uh, before I turn it over uh, to my colleague, which I'm sure he has questions. Uh, I, want, I wanted to know more about your placement in permanency specialists. What's the ratio of, of the specialists to youth? Yeah, let me, let me ask um, Associate Commissioner John Dixon to answer that one. Thank you. Um, currently, our ratio is 1 to 15, so that's one staff to 15 youth. Is that a good ratio? I, I, I wouldn't know. I mean, I'm sure the, sp the advocates will, and the nonprofits will have their opinion, but I'm just curious from your perspective. Um, from our perspective, it, it's pretty close. The, I, we believe the ideal ratio would be 1 to 12, given the scope of work that we're asking them to do. And it, it's hard, to, this is a hard thing to compare to other jurisdictions because the work differs. But for our workers, given the fact that they support kids while in placement and then while they transition to aftercare, they're responsible for making the contacts while on aftercare, they go to court hearings with kids, they plan with, with uh, the partner agencies, we think 1 to 12 would be the ideal ratio. So they're working with them while they're at the detention center from day one, or at what point do they take over? They, they begin working with the youth um, once the family court has decided to place the child in close to home. So it's not right when they get into detention, it's at that point in time uh, when the child is placed in close to home. We have 14 days at that point to move that child from detention into one of our residences and the PPS begins working with that child and their family during that time frame. At what point do they no, are no longer responsible for the youth after care? So let's say they've been out for three months, six months, a year. So when kids are placed in close to home, they're placed for a determinate period of time. Generally speaking, it's 12 months, though we do receive 18 month lengths of placement. And in some cases, it's shortened because of time served while kids are in detention. So sometimes we get youth as short as four to six months. So what we try to do is tailor for those sort of unusual cases, we try to tailor our approach with them. But generally speaking, the, the, the PPS is with that child from the beginning right to the, right till expiration. Though the work doesn't always end there because the relationship has formed and sometimes kids after they're done with close to home and they're done with close to home aftercare reach back out to the PPS for additional support or to help them navigate some sort of system that they're involved with. I'm sorry, I, I thought I was under the impression that they, after they leave and they go back to their families, they still follow up with them? Is oh yeah. Okay, and how long is, is that yeah. for? G well, so again, so kids are in placement roughly for about half of their time in close to home. 
So the PPS then stays with them for the remainder of their time. So that, generally speaking, is a period of five or six months for a 12-month commitment, but it might be as long as nine or 10 months for an 18-month commitment. And it, how often do they meet with the, with the youth? Do they meet with them once a week or? Initially, um, th that varies depending upon the needs of the kid. Initially, kids are met with once, once a week for the first six weeks while they're assigned, um, and then that can vary based upon other services and supports. We don't want to overwhelm the child or family with supports, so if they receive services from an in-home evidence-based program like MST or FFT, they're getting pretty intensive contacts and services up to maybe two to three per week, so at that point the PPS may back off. But uh, approximately 45 days after release to placement, we have a planning and support meeting, which Deputy Commissioner Franco referenced as a family team conference. And at that point, after the child has been on aftercare for a period of a roughly six weeks, then we reevaluate. And then that supervision could be stepped up or it could be stepped down depending on how well that child's doing. Uh, is there any data gathered uh, by the specialist at all? Um, yeah, I mean, PP, the, um, I mean, I think it's important what one John, you know, Associate Commissioner Dixon is trying to represent. Our PPS, as our permanency planning specialists, have the overarching role of managing the case, but they're actually part of a team. So that team could be composed of an MST therapist, could be composed of an interrupter from cure violence. All of them are trying to work together. That's why the administration has really invested in the use of, of family team conferencing as a way of creating shared accountability among, among the multiple stakeholders. Uh, in terms of data, I mean, we, we look at school attendance, we look at, you know, are they complying with treatment, is the family engaged in the support that they're getting at the home, and I think all of that helps to paint the picture. Is the youth and the family progressing, or do we need to step up the intervention? So the specialty, the specialty is in contact with the schools? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that was going to be my next question. Uh, who, who, who welcomes the child into the school? Is the school counselor responsible? Social worker? Yes. So every um, student in whether it's detention or placement is assigned a, a DOE transition specialist. This is a new initiative that started uh, two years ago in September. These are school. Uh, their titles in the school are guidance counselors and social workers. And their job is to work on educational transition planning for the time the youth is in detention or placement, and then follow up for six months after they leave. So is their role is... Like, is this from the school, or, or is this just a board of ed person that oversees the whole operation? So while the kids are in detention and placement, the school they attend is an educational program called Passages Academy. Okay. So the educational transition specialists all work for Passages Academy. Those transition specialists will connect with counselors or other individuals in the schools that children are returning to. Do they get counseling in school at all, or yes. by who? The social worker? By the okay. social worker and the guidance counselor. At Passages, we actually split the counseling roles. Some of our social workers and counselors work as transition specialists. So their main job is they spend about they spend some time in school planning with kids for transition, and then they go out in the community for the kids who have been released, and they meet with them and their families at schools if they need a new school, check up on their attendance. And then we also have in passages what we call school-based counselors. Those are people who are always in the school programs in detention and placement, and they provide a range of services from the mandated counseling that kids might need for special education services to just generalized counseling, you know, if the kid is having an issue in class or something. I'm smiling because I used to be a school counselor, right. and I know how many students I had to take care yes. for, and it's very, very <laughs> difficult to meet with them on a weekly basis. Uh, so I'm, I'm just curious as to the school counselors, what the case loads look yep. like, and if it's the regular school counselor, the in-house one. I'm just wondering if it's realistic to expect from them that they're able to handle uh, you know, these, uh, I'm assuming, one per week uh, meetings. Yes. So we actually have a much higher um, number of counselors than a typical school does. Passages Academy has 25 counselors for an active register of about 200 students, That's which right. I'm sure is a lot different than when you were a, a counselor. A lot different. Um, and they, and, should uh, have, I should have worked back then. That's uh, right. Yeah. That's right. Um, but currently the transition spe specialist caseload, if you break it down by the numbers, is about 1 to 50 but that's a combination of kids who are currently uh, in detention or placement plus kids who are on the outside. And the caseload is always shifting because 
cases close. Um, so it's it's about one to fifty, but uh, active at any one time, it's really a little bit lower than that. I wanted to ask you on page three. You mentioned three, uh, six uh, transitional points. Can you mention what those are? Sure. I think John Key can. Yeah, I think you're referring oh, to the okay. said moment where we actually bring everyone together. Sure. So, so the, so we've identified those critical junctures where we need to pull everybody together so we can plan thoughtfully. Um, the first one is at the transition from detention to placement. Um, and again, so the, all these, w the goal is to have um, the ACS placement permanency specialist, the ACS conference facilitation specialist, the residential provider, um, the education transition specialist when they're available, um, the family or whoever the discharge or intended discharge support is for that child and the child as well um, as part of these conferences. So the first one happens at the transition um, to from detention to placement. Um, the second one, if you want me to just kind of go through those when yeah, they occur. Please. Sure, the second one um, happens uh, roughly um, 90 days into placement. We call that the comprehensive <coughs> planning and support meeting. That's where we are beginning to really think about what are the discharge resources needed, when is this child going to be released from placement. Um, the next one is 30 days prior to the release to aftercare so that we can make sure all the services are in place and if we need to correct anything or reevaluate that discharge plan, we can do that right then and there. Um, the next one occurs 30 days or 45, 30 to 45 days after placement to evaluate how that initial transition's gone. Um, the last one happens about 60 days prior to release so that we can determine whether or not that child should be extended or if other services are needed for that child to be successful. And I think I missed one along the way. Oh, there's a 30-day one after the child has been placed um, in the residence after they have left attention to make sure that uh, the kid's settling in well and if there's any issues that need to be identified that will reconcile them there. Very good. I um, wanted to ask you about the cure violence. You mentioned, mm -hmm. Commissioner, that there's one per borough. Mm -hmm. So explain explain to us what that means because there are more than one sure. cure violence program. Yeah, I mean, thanks to the city council, we actually were able to um, put together this pilot adaptation of cure violence. And as you know um, better than anyone, cure violence has been extremely effective in New York City to reduce... Um, the likelihood of violence, particularly gun violence, in many, many, many neighborhoods. What we did with support from the city council is build on these um, credible messengers that actually are embedded in some neighborhoods and actually got them to go through training uh, around positive youth development and, and the human and justice system and then build the capacity of some of these credible me messengers, interrupters, to be able to connect to young people, which is something that was not originally in the intent of cure violence. So again, being a pilot, we began with only five of them, one per borough. Uh, we have actually had a success, significant success for the last two years of getting these interrupters to understand brain development of young people, understand how to talk to young people. <laughs> and they have been very effective connecting to young people in the residences when they're with us for six to eight months. and then be available in some communities. Again, as you know, they're actually targeting certain neighborhoods to make sure those young people are not going back to their own ne negative peer networks. Um, I think it's a matter of actually, but like any pilot, you want to begin small. I think, you know, to answer your question, I think uh, we're at that moment where we should be looking at evaluating this adaptation and figure out how to expand it. Now, Commissioner, yesterday I was a uh, criminal uh, justice hearing and <coughs> I asked the uh, new commissioner, uh, and she mentioned that this, and I'm wondering if it's the same pilot program, the cure violence, but then it was only for two months, uh, and that there was no more funding. This is not the situation, no, no, here, right? We, so we, we still we still have in we, the cure we support violence. from from the city council. We actually have uh, another year of funding and beautiful. And to your question, I think this is a moment to start looking at evaluating this adaptation. That's great. And we're hoping the that. relationships that are formed while they're working with the kid while they're in close to home, both placement and aftercare, continue after that as well, because we see that you know that's part of the value of the program is that 
kids are in those neighborhoods, they're connected to those positive adults, and we want them to sustain that relationship long after they're done with us. Yeah, well, he, he has been, um, he, he has actually gone beyond all of our expectations, as you know. I mean, we I had a recent meeting with um, one, the Queens provider, Life Camp, and one of the credible messengers, which I got to meet very well, is the mother of a of a child who actually died because of, 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 of gun violence in, in Jamaica, Queens. And and she has become particularly useful uh, as a credible messenger, not just to talk to the young people, but also to talk to the parents of our young people to really get them motivated, to get them away from the life of crime. Well, I tell you, when uh, myself and Council Member Germani Williams and uh, some of the experts that are here today uh, who are running the programs, as well, uh, when we started, it's gone beyond our expectation. It, I believe it's the best uh, uh, gun cure violence type of program in the United States. We've seen numbers that are amazing. So I, I commend all the programs that are doing a fabulous, fabulous job. Even in my district, we've seen a significant change in numbers. Of, we've seen 66% drop on um, um, murders in my district, uh, and a lot of the credit belongs to uh, those programs. I want to take, uh, pass it on to my good friend, uh, Council Member uh, Barry Grodonczyk. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, just a couple of questions. You know, the chair often asks the questions we all want to ask. I'm not a chair, so I have to wait my turn. Um, how many people do we currently, how many young people currently at our close to home facilities across the city, can you tell us? Yes, um, we have a total currently of 242 youth in close to home. 181 of those are in residential placement and 61 of those are on aftercare. And um, the passages academies that are spread around the city, how do those young people get to those? Are they driven because they're not, obviously, maybe some of them are in close proximity, but these are, so Passages Academy operates in both detention and placement. So it's in detention and close to home. So we're in the secure detention centers of Horizon and Crossroads. Okay. Uh, we have a school, uh, we call it Belmont in Brooklyn, um, where various providers bring kids from both close to home and non-secure detention. And we have a similar facility in the Bronx called Bronx Hope. Uh, kids come from their group homes in vans every day and they're brought to those regular, their regular DOE buildings. Okay, and the school day is a as would be for any other child? All the kids, whether it's in detention or in any of the close home facilities, are a full school day. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the PPS people. Do they operate, you know, because you're across the city and we know the travel time, right, Mr. Chairman, can take us longer than we anticipate. So um, I'm wondering, are, if, if I were a PPS, would I be located in Queens or the Bronx because to cut down on the amount of travel time, or are they lo located all, maybe they have all their clients in one facility, how does that work? That has changed during, since Close to Home opened. It used to be that we just sort of randomly assigned in terms of uh, where the kids were from, but now um, we've created five teams, and those teams are based on where children are returning back to, so that we have a, a team in the Bronx, we have a team that serves kids in Queens, we have a team that serves kids in Brooklyn, we have a team that serves um, Brooklyn and Queens, so we, need, we really need three teams for those two boroughs because of the number of kids coming from those boroughs. And then we have one team that um, fills in for help assist with the Bronx and then covers Manhattan and Staten Island as well. Um, one of our teams has currently been embedded in the borough, uh, in the Bronx. Um, we're looking to add borough-based space for the other teams. And my last question, um, how would you say you're doing? <laughs> I'll let you rate yourself right now. Yeah, I mean, because um, we had some issues, as you know, with yes, yes, uh, I mean, close to um, home um, in Brooklyn, I guess is the one I remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously that could happen anywhere, but. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, if, if you think about you know, two, two, two data elements, I mean, in terms of the, the low level of youth crime in New York City, I mean, which is historically low, that's something that I believe the, the way that close to home and many of our partner agencies are addressing juvenile justice is in the right trajectory. Um, and then the, the fact that actually um, 
if you think nationally, any other youth in a juvenile justice system would be far away from home in a school run by the juvenile justice system of that state, Illinois or New York State some years ago, um, far away from their family, without the ability of being able to make connections with credible messengers or to the faith-based community or to a clinic in that community. The fact that actually we can do that, I mean, the fact that we actually are accountable to make sure that those transitions are intentional, that young people are not just dumped back into the community, which is what used to happen, it happens most places across the nation. I mean, as, as John well described before, no youth goes home with actually earning that right to go home because he has shown that he has learned some new skills. And actually, he doesn't go home until we feel that the family has the support that they need to do well. Um, I, th I think that's the, the, the biggest, the biggest um, testament to our um, success. Um, I mean, if you look at numbers, which I think Nick could actually provide in terms of um, credits, um, uh, transitions to schools, timeliness of those transitions, we're better than we have ever been in the last 15 years. And the age range for kids at, in close to home? So, um, you know, I think the average age of kids in close to home, John, tell me if I'm wrong, is 16. So, I mean, even though our system is, um, you know, cuts off juvenile justice at age 15, most of the kids who actually, when they get to close to home, they're 16. And we have a significant number of 16 and some 18 year olds. Yeah, the, the, the prime. Uh, the largest age group is 16-year-olds, followed by 15, followed by 17, followed by 14, and then 13 and 18. There's just a few. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, just two more questions. Um, do you have data to show how effective the functional family therapy and the multisystemic therapy had been uh, yeah, I mean, bo both programs are actually uh, have been very, very well documented nationally as in terms of their effectiveness of changing the trajectory of young people in the juvenile justice system. I mean, they are either used as a preventive tool, which actually we do in New York City, and, or they are used as an aftercare tool, which we are doing for close to home. Um, if, you were, if you were to look at any national cost-benefit analysis of what works in juvenile justice, I believe both of those are at the top. Um, our experience is the following, and I think this is what John alluded to. We know that they work. We also are clearly understand now that some young people need more than just family therapy. So I think our most recent investments that I alluded to, building on continuity of care by the providers, focusing more on neighborhood support relationships like the Boys and Girls Club, YMCA, corner store programs, are meant to address what we have identified as one of the things that we need to do more of. Families need support, young people need prosocial peers, they need mentors. That's what we're investing in doing more of. That leads me to my last question. What's the next step? What do you see in the future? Any future plans? Yeah, um, you know, I think we want to build on, the, on our um, knowledge at ACS on the, of the value of uh, family team conferencing. I mean, is is a family grounded intervention that has made a significant um, impact in child safety at ACS, and it's beginning to make a significant impact in uh, outcomes for young people in close to home, and John can talk about that. Uh, we are also planning to release an RFP to look at transformative mentorships before the end of the year. And just to add to that, as we get better at utilizing that tool that probation uses to assess the needs of kids, um, that will dr that will change how we service plan kids. It'll change how we think about connecting kids to services when they return to the community. So I think that that is the bedrock, the foundation of a successful juvenile justice system, and we're just now catching up with it. So we're hoping to be fully on board and moving with that come March of next year. Fantastic, and uh, Commissioner, thank you uh, for hearing my calls. You know, since we first met, my first call was for a mentorship program, and thank you for taking a step. Uh, now it's gonna be very tangible, visual, yeah. visual uh, program that we're gonna be able to have and help uh, the young people. I believe it's gonna be very, very effective. Thank you so much. Continue the great work that you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. And with that, uh, we're gonna have Reverend Wendy Calderon from Bronx Connect, Fernando Martinez, Osborne Association, Cato A. Gray from Center for Employment Opportunities, 
and Tina Schleider from Children's Village. You could come up, no fear. Three out of four. I'm a, are we missing somebody? Who are we missing? Uh, Reverend Wendy Calderon, Fernando Martinez, Cato A. Gray, and Tina Schleider. Okay. There we go. No, that was not it. Okay, you may begin. Please identify yourself. Uh, my name is Wendy Calderon Payne. I'm the executive director over Bronx Connect. Sorry, let me just remind everybody we have a three minute time clock. Okay. okay. All right. Um, Okay, so I have a, a paper here that I was going to read you a whole bunch of statistics on how terrible we're doing in the Bronx and in Manhattan, and I think you guys know that, right? Actually, you're the city, you're the juvenile justice major. So I'm not going to read that anymore because I've only got three minutes. Uh, I'm going to say this, that uh, Bronx Connect began in 1999 really as a challenge to the South Bronx church community. Could the community, which had always dealt exceptionally well with young people who wanted to come to church, also deal exceptionally well with high-risk youth who had absolutely no desire to go to church. Could we take the social capital of all of our young men and women who had actually gone through hell in the South Bronx but had been able to change their lives and were leading productive lives? And so we took up the challenge to see if we could deal with really high-risk youth and we did, and so I'm going to remind people that when we began this, right, when we began Bronx Connect in 1999, we had, I think, 22,000 people in Rikers at any given day. Uh, there was, we, we created the credible messenger. We just didn't call them credible messengers. We called them us, right? The first mentor I ever interviewed, I asked him if he had ever been incarcerated for a crime. I don't know, I think I, and he said, well, you know, they got me for running a crack den, but they had to throw out the case because of some technicality. So he was an elder at a local church for over five years, and his crack days were 20 years behind, but he was, to me, the perfect mentor because he was a black man who was not afraid of our young people. Internally, he used to be that young person, and if anything, he was willing to do anything, walk into any projects, any dangerous place. And back then, I mean, the Bronx, uh, New York City is significantly less dangerous than when we started, but he was the best. So I'm very excited about the kind of reentry work we're discussing. I feel like we're part of it, but I'm going to remind the um, I'm going to remind the city council that we need to really work to make sure that reentry dollars go to community-based agencies. And I always say this to city council members: every time you enforce an RFP that favors a community-based agency you actually employ the very people you're trying to set as an example. And I've said this to my staff. Every black and Hispanic man we employ tells our young people that gainful employment is worth it. Yes, they see a lot of black and Hispanic women in our office, but we actively go after those who represent our young people. So we are excited. We are doing reentry work with um, Friends of Ireland, and we had our first kid come back, get his $100 gifts card, and he's employing for an OSHA job. So this is our success. That is my three-minute testimony. Good morning. My name is Tina Schleicher. I'm an MST fit expert that works with the Children's Village. I've worked in evidence-based treatment serving youth that have been incarcerated for more than 17 years. Um, most of the time I've worked with families that have had their children removed for a number of reasons and have often been plagued with delinquency issues. Our family integrated transition programs designed to work with the youth that are leaving residential settings and returning back to their homes and natural ecology. Young people placed in facility are 38% more likely to have an adult record. So preventing further recidivism is, and offsetting this path is essential for children and families to thrive. 
the MST FIT model addresses those core needs related to the family, the immediate ecology, and the individual to more sufficiently impact the factors that are leading to recidivism. And without changing these factors, we know that the impact of the skills that are often gained will just deteriorate when they're faced back with the same elements that contributed to some of their behavior prior to placement. So we're focusing on the engagement of multiple systems around the youth to support a successful transition. And we determine these needs and make them uniquely designed to each of the individuals that we're working with. And so our focus is really on getting the strengths of the family, setting goals that are designed by the family, and using discharge planning that's going to support their ever-changing circumstances. In 2016, we had 34 youth that had completed um, MST FIT in the Closer to Home initiative. And 71% of those youth were living at home and had no new charges during their entire course of aftercare. So with this information, I just want to conclude with some recommendations that we've gained from our frontline experience. First, successful reentry requires that we begin work while the youth is incarcerated. This means that it's critical that we actively engage family um, right from the very beginning and we define family broadly enough that we're including extended family and any adults that are willing to participate who have concern for this child's future. We also want to make sure these engagement efforts are starting at the earliest opportunity and that all efforts are persisting throughout the entire life of their involvement in services. Second, every young person needs an opportunity to experience growth in their natural ecology. And while it's really difficult to pinpoint exact family readiness, the reality is that skills must be used and practiced where they are needed for both the families and young people to adapt to real world challenges and only then will they experience the success and the competencies that are needed. Families will often doubt themselves, and the longer that a youth is incarcerated, the easier it is for those bonds to fray. When individual and community safety can be assured, reentry plans should have every reasonable option to have a youth home through visitation as well as really timely reunification planning. In our experience, this type of planning for the youth and the family and pre-release visitation is both possible and successful. Third and finally, we have families that are, we need to have our families devolved in decision making. We have a responsibility to protect the integrity of the family's decisions, and they must be empowered to support their goals, values, and beliefs that are essential to their child. And again, if we can find, you know, follow this fundamental principle of collaboration with families, I believe it will increase our success. So thank you for this opportunity. Good morning, Chairperson Cabrera and members of the committee. My name is Keto Gray, and I'm the manager of Youth Services for the Center for Employment Opportunities, or CEO. CEO is a nonprofit organization that helps formerly incarcerated men and women develop the skills and confidence they need to succeed in the workforce and lead fulfilling lives. Since its, its, in, its inception, CEO has served nearly 16,000 people in New York City, 26 years old and younger. Today, almost 50% of the men and women we serve are young adults. I could share countless stories of these men and women, but I want to share Darren's story with you today. Darren came to CEO earlier this year when he was 25 years old. His probation officer referred him because his job prospects were bleak. When he arrived at our office, he lacked a high school diploma, work experience, and confidence. Today, he has a full-time job with Vice Media Corporation. Darren had learned about the new apprentice program we were developing with Vice Media while working on a CEO transitional work crew. He was interested but, but hesitated to apply because he worried he would not qualify. Um, he surprised himself, and with the help of CEO, CEO staff and his own determination, he became one of five finalists. Darren worked at Vice for six months and impressed the staff so much that he was hired full-time by Vice, along with two other CEO apprentices. He's now enrolled in the HSE program at LaGuardia Community College and plans to pursue his college career, his college, college degree. Unfortunately, many young men and women don't end up, and, 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 end up as well as Darren. So statistics show that young men of color 16 to 25 years old represent 91% of all admissions to New York City correctional facilities. A Bureau of Justice Statistics found that approximately 76% of people who were under the age of 25 when released from prison were rearrested within three years, and 84% were rearrested within five years. These young men have become disconnected from their communities as they struggle with access to education, employment, safe housing, healthy living, and a sense of belonging. CEO is investing more resources to combat these trends. We're, tailor we're tailoring our program to meet the unique needs of these young men and women with innovations such as the addition of, uh, or adding, the addition of credible mentors for the young adults in our program. 
These mentors engage participants outside of business hours to ensure that they attend appointments and avoid situations that might lead to further justice system involvement. Also being, also being offered, um, also by, by offering peer groups and other youth development activities designed for young adults, CEO's youth service staff, which is my staff, um, we aim to deepen young, young adult commitment to CEO's program and to their personal goals. We look forward to continuing to work with New York City with New York City Council to support the young men and women who are the future of our great city. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the testimony. I just want to share that earlier we were joined by Councilman Lanceman and now we're joined with Councilmember Perkins. Um, I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, can you share with me uh, why uh, the MST uh, approach is effective? Well, it's effective for a number of reasons because everything that we are doing in MST has been highly researched. So we're really narrowing our range of interventions to the things that actually supported increased chance likelihood of being successful. In addition to just working with the family as our primary source, we work throughout the entire ecology. So if that entity touches a child's life or can have an influence on them, then they become part of our treatment package. So it's not just the youth or the family. We are working with the schools. We're working with their faith-based organizations. We're working with the friends. We're working with the neighbors. So I mean, that kind of approach really is kind of holistic. So when you have a young person who is rather stuck, you know, we can kind of create a world and environment around them, teaching them, training them, reinforcing the kind of decision-making ability that we want them to have. And so it's kind of like we don't necessarily need their immediate buy-in. You know, we can work with the buy-in of anybody who can touch this child's life. So I think just having that vast exposure. The other thing we're doing is we're making sure that what's lost, you know, what happens in residential isn't lost. You know, so what will happen is they'll learn these sets of skills, these DBT skills, and we teach and train the family. We start two months before the youth ever comes home. And so parents have no idea what DBT is. They don't often know or understand the skills that the kid's are learning. If they don't know it, they can't reinforce it or hold them accountable to doing it. Right. So we're going to go in there and start teaching and training the parents on exactly what is a skillful behavior, how to talk about it, how to do it in a real-world context because people don't talk therapy talk you know, to their friends right. or their families. So we translate this stuff into a real-world language so it can be reinforced and supported. We integrate that into safety plans, whether it's in the community or in the home. And so we're truly really trying to build on how do you not lose what you've gained and then grow it further throughout the entire style of that family. And how long is usually the program? That the um, we're experience? working on an average for about six months. We start two months pre-release, and then we carry the case through after the youth is in aftercare, depending on their length of disposition. So we don't always have control around our end date. We are thankful that depending on dates of disposition, we can work within about a 30-day period to make sure that we are doing everything we can to transition further to a decrease of service. That's great. And this question is for everyone. What, uh, if you could address on how we get fathers involved, because I think one of the biggest problems mm -hmm. we have, especially with young men, sure. is um, the absentee fathers. So mm -hmm. how do you engage the youth? Uh, does somebody else take that pseudo, a pseudo role? Well, actually, we would address that in multiple factors because the first thing that we would want to look at is really what are some of the source drivers for the disengagement. We know that a lot of our parents, you know, maybe the partnership has dissolved or maybe there's other relationships or other factors or things going on. Um, so we're trying to understand, you know, how exactly, like what's maintaining that lack of connection today. And so we might initially be the person to kind of outreach broker, bring that person into an awareness, try to increase their sense of urgency, you know, related to the role that they could have in literally changing or saving their child's life. And then trying to make sure that we have other, you know, folks that can be involved, other connections. So if for any reason it is not safe for, let's say, the mother or the caregiver of the child to be in close connectivity, with our ability to work throughout the entire ecology and family system, we find those safe brokers and do that. Right now we're also working in two households where there's been histories of domestic violence to ensure that while there was difficulties in that type of relationship, the parent-child relationship is much different. And so ensuring things like routine visitations, a safe contact and go-between person, 
using safety planning so information can be ch ch um, exchanged in like a non-threatening way where they all feel safe back and forth between the parents is keeping this kid involved with his father on a regular basis. I also think there, there has to be something like of a citywide. You know, when, when America decided that smoking was no good for us, there was a, a national, you know, advertisement, smoking is no good for you. So I'm going to say this. It's recorded on Blunt. You know, in, when welfare came around, there was a national understanding that if black and Hispanic women had men, they got less welfare. So they had to hide their men, right? So it really cracked the family, in my opinion. And I think the city, just like we're having a great mental health kind of um, program where we're talking about mental health, we need to talk about the importance of our, our men in our children's lives, that we need our men. And I actually just said this to somebody, you know, slavery robbed Africa of millions of men. Incarceration has robbed the inner city of millions of men. That's, you know, we look up and our, where are our men? My friends have said, where are my husbands for my daughters? They're incarcerated. So I think the city has to value fatherhood. And, and I'm not sure how that goes down from the laws. But so I, I do think that now in, in terms of that, some fatherhood relationships will not be uh, rescued. But also the providers, and I've heard providers say this, we have to value the family. Because sometimes providers talk about families like they're the worst thing. No, that mother and father and uncle and grandfather's love might be what takes that young person out of the behavior. Well, so I think that we need to uh, make sure that our providers are of the community because we want our families back. I mean, I, I also agree. Um, valuing value the family, we, we definitely need to do that. I also feel that um, bridging uh, or building, repairing partnerships is also important, and having that bridge to repair. Um, I'm also a product of a broken household, raised by my mother. Father was never around, so it's this is really big for me and really important for me. Um, I feel that having a bridge. A lot of fathers, they. They, they, they were absentee, they were out. But they were, at certain points, they're afraid to come back into mm -hmm. the life of the child, right? They're afraid to, they don't know how to, how to come back into the life of the child. They don't know how to even approach the mother of their child. So I think, you know, organizations and being able to kind of help bridge that. Because there's a lot, of, I mean, especially at CEO, there's a, lot, there's a lot of people who want that relationship but don't know how. Don't know how to, how to, how to go about doing that. Mm -hmm. So I think having um, a program with people that can help bridge that initial relationship and, and do that. You know, it would be reward, it would be rewarding. And just to add, even with my father, my father came back into my life when I was late late twenties, early thirties, and he was out. He said he was afraid. He didn't know how to make that approach and how how to come back in. So I think just having somebody there or um, to kind of help bridge that would definitely be dynamic. And congratulations and uh, reconciliation. Uh, let me turn it over now to Councilmember Perkins. He has a few questions. Um, do, do you have a sort of a demographic kind of breakdown on the, the, the juveniles that we're concerned about that you, in terms of race? We and, uh, thank you. you know. So I can just read you some stats if that's what you're asking for. Um, give me one second. So... Um, New York City Comstat reported that in 2016, the Bronx experienced 20,000 violent crimes, which represented 20% of the city's violent crimes. Uh, let me go. Statistics worsen among the city's 1 million youth, ages 16 to 24. One of every six, 170,000, are unemployed, out of school, not engaged in any program or job. These disconnected youth and young adults have low level of educational attainment and limited work experience, uh, are among those who have the hardest time finding decent jobs. Um, and then there's another statistic that I just thought was uh, a New York City study released in early 2014 found that by age 18, 30% of black men, 20% of Latino men, 22% of white men had been arrested by age of 23. The numbers climbed to 49% of black men, 44% of Latino men, and 38% of white men. 
In such a context, the, young, you, the youth recently incarcerated individuals are more likely to return to criminal justice system and then to pursue sustainable employment. Um, in addition, even our, our, let's see, it's assumed that many of the young people in Rikers will require substance abuse, special education services, educational services. According to OCFS, 74% of incarcerated youth were identified as needing treatment for substance abuse, 49% needed special education, 44% were screened in as needing mental health services. 60% of the youth ages 16 to 18 in Rikers are reading at below a fifth grade level. And, and I've always said this, if we're not dealing with the educational system, we're feeding the incarceration system. I guess uh, this sounds like a, some kind of holocaust to me. It is. And, um, but it's, uh, and, and it doesn't seem as if we have uh, like discovered how to get past this holocaust. Because these statistics are not uh, are stubborn and if not stubborn, growing. They're not diminishing from my observation. Um, am I correct? Do you see, uh, uh, are things improving? I think even worse, recently under Bloomberg, our, our graduation rate went up, but that was because we had lowered what it took to graduate. So even so though- Graduation, if they, if they lowered it to zero, then everybody would have graduated. Well, so the issue was even when they graduated- You um, understand yeah. what I'm saying? That if, you, if you lower the level, of achievement, then that'll make us look good, but it won't mean that we did good because all you did was make it, you know, easier. So, so, that, with, the, so that the statistics would look better. Right. So with the graduation rate, only 12.7 of black students and 13.3 of Hispanic students were ready for community college. Not John Jay, not Lehman, not Harvard. So do we have statistics that differentiate the, uh, the, the situation between the men and the women? You know, what are, the, what are the statistics for the women versus the statistics for the men? Is there a distinction or is it all one? Like are women faring better? Is that what you're saying? More or less, however you want to determine the distinction. Mm -hmm. I feel like over 90% of the, not over 95% of the people we work with are men. So I don't, I don't. Same thing with CEO, yeah, over ninety five percent of men. And in terms of the uh, the women, are they predominantly women of color? Of course. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, and um, do we have uh, sort of uh, like where are these young people living when they uh, become a part of these statistics? Five zip codes. There are five zip codes in New York City that feed into the justice system. And I have always said it, if we could take those five zip codes and intensively address education from kindergarten on, we could train. So in 10 years, we don't need car cure violence. And what are those zip codes, by the way? I'd have to get them for you. Okay. Those zip but codes are, I would dare say, obviously, South Bronx. the so-called Harlem Street, and yeah. El Barrios of the city, mm -hmm. like 10029. 104, uh -huh. okay. 55. Five, five. Five. And, and so I'm concerned about the fact that uh, this, this is like this is a, a sort of a stubborn kind of statistic that's, is it growing or is it going down? Well, I think crime has gone down in New York City, the, and thus the, the rates of incarceration have gone down. But in you terms of this population that we're talking about, what is the status of, the, of it going up or down? Are we? Are we conquering this issue, this, this challenge that these young people are suffering under, or, are we, or is, that, is that population, is that statistic growing? So I'm going to say this, having done this for two decades, I, I feel like we are recidivating and creating babies to feed a justice system that's making somebody rich. So that's, that's what I feel. So, if you're, so the number of people in the incarceration system is less but the fact that you're still addressing the same communities going in and out of this system that is feeding someone's budget. So that, that's where I don't feel that that has changed. And that's what was so frustrating. Because when I went to high school um, 
Only 25% of Hispanics graduated, so now we have a higher graduation rate, but the high school diploma doesn't mean anything. Because you still have to go to college, take remedial classes, and you lose your Pell Grant. So y the uh, population is growing, you're saying? Sorry, I'm sorry? This population is growing? No, there are less people in the justice system now than when we began two, two decades ago. But it's still 90% black and Hispanic and poor okay. and uneducated and lack of literacy and mental health needs and drug abuse. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Uh, just to give a stat uh, based on our briefing paper, uh, for the fiscal year 2017, uh, total of admission was 2,126 with an average daily population 119. Last week when I met with uh, the Deputy Commissioner, if I recall right, there were like 30-something uh, youth uh, in the detention center. Uh, it, it, it changes, it used to be, used to have over 2,000 yep. there, uh, both in Horizon and uh, Crossroads. So we have seen a significant change, but there's still much more to be done. Well, I want to thank you for this panel, uh, for your information. Uh, we'll definitely take in consideration into our next step. And with the last panel, uh, last but not least, uh, very important, uh, Christine Bella from the Legal Aid Society, Rebecca, Kinsella from Brooklyn Defense Services and Kevin Kirol's grad student. You could begin as soon as uh, you're ready and just identify yourself. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Rebecca Kinsella. I'm a youth social worker at Brooklyn Defender Services. And in this role, I provide ongoing support to both youth in the community and incarcerated youth during the pendency of their criminal cases. Youth do better when they can remain close to their homes and communities where they can easily access their families and their existing team of advocates. When a young person is in local detention, this allows us to assist youth and their families in education advocacy and providing referrals to vocational services, behavioral health services, and housing upon their release. I wanna share two stories that contrast the experiences of New York City kids who remain in the city versus kids sent upstate. Marcus, an 18-year-old client of mine, was recently released from Rikers Island after serving a sentence of one year. While Marcus remained at Rikers Island, we were able to continue working with him, visiting him bi-weekly and using our visits to discuss his educational aspirations. Marcus, a recent high school graduate, was invested in pursuing his college degree, something he could not do while detained at Rikers Island. We worked with Marcus and his family to complete college applications from the inside ensuring his acceptance prior to his release. As a result, when he, was, when he finished serving his sentence, Marcus began his college career just a short time later. Without our support, it's likely that Marcus and his family would have struggled to complete this process prior to his release. However, Marcus's story is unique. The more common story is the case of Joaquin. Joaquin was sent upstate to a juvenile detention facility where he served almost two years. Joaquin's family struggled to provide regular visits upstate, resulting in further disengagement from his community. Upon release, Joaquin was put on a train with no critical supports in place and was sent to the city with his mother waiting on the other side. Joaquin and his family struggled with reunification. Having been apart for almost two years, they were forced to rebuild relationships and navigate the shared trauma of incarceration. This was a critical time in Joaquin's life, a time that, if given the right supports and services, it would have been a time for growth. Unfortunately, Joaquin was not connected with adequate services, such as mentorship or in-home family therapy, in part because eligibility criteria restricted him from accessing certain services as he no longer had an open criminal court matter. As a result, Joaquin experienced increased family tension, ultimately resulting in his rearrest and finding himself back in the system today. 
We believe that there is much the city can do to improve reentry services for all youth, including youth who are never sent upstate. First, we'd ask that the council increase funding for social work services in public defense offices. This would allow us, those of us that are already doing this critical work, to continue doing so while expanding our reach to those clients of ours that ultimately are serving sentences in upstate facilities. Second, we'd ask that the city help to make existing programs more accessible. For example, Families Rising, a program that provides intensive in-home family therapy for justice-involved youth. It ultimately helps them learn important skills and navigate their communities and families. Finally, I'd like to quickly highlight the need for increased funding for housing and services for homeless youth. A colleague of mine recently testified about this need, sharing how family tensions result in the arrest of young people and subsequent orders of protection render our young clients homeless. We'd encourage the council to act on these bills. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Christine Bella, and I'm an attorney with the Legal Aid Society's Juvenile Rights Practice. So thank you for, again for the opportunity to, uh, for the Legal Aid Society to provide input into this important topic. So in recent years, we acknowledge that ACS has dedicated significant resources to improve its discharge and reentry practices. And as anticipated through Close to Home, ACS has addressed some of the major obstacles to successful reentry. As the Council is well aware, Close to Home is fully implemented now and constitutes a major and much needed transformation in juvenile justice practices. So I just want to echo what Ms. Ms. Kinsella said. Close to home supplanted a dysfunctional state system where youth, the juvenile delinquency place youth, were deprived of essential contact with family, denied educational credits for work completed, and exposed to um, dangerous restraints as well as excessively high recidivism rates. So we are encouraged by close to home, we are encouraged by aspects of ACS's aftercare services as they are consistent with best practices. I want to touch on, however, a few of the areas where we see a need for improvement um, and uh, those focus mainly on the timeliness of aftercare services as well as some of the um, school reentry and, and educational services. First, um, we are concerned that referrals for critical aftercare are not made in a timely manner. I'll give you one example of a young man um, that he and his mother were told that they would be receiving Bridges to Health, which is a critical um, service that's provided to young people leaving care. Um, and, and one of the main goals of B2H is to prevent the need for reincarceration or any institutional care. So B2H unfortunately did not contact the family until at least one month after the child was released. And some two months later, the service plan had not yet been finalized or approved. And it was uh, several months before the services began. Uh, that's a critical time when youth are home. We believe ideally that B2H applications should be submitted um, at least 90 days prior to the release home to allow for the interagency coordination and coordination with the family. And practice is rarely occurs. Relatedly, um, we see problems that arise when initial referrals are not a good fit for the youth or family. So ideally, we'd like to see youth attending some of the outpatient or pro-social activities prior to their release from the program to work out any difficulties or kinks there might be. This way, the youth or the family, if they have any concerns about a particular service provider or program, an alternative can be arranged. It's not unusual for a young person to be released uh, with intake appointments that are scheduled one to two to four weeks out and that delay obviously can cause problems, anxiety, um, and um, obviously does not uh, provide support for the necessary support for the family. So the, the, the remainder of my um, recommendations really relate to educational services. I was pleased to see a representative from the Department of Education here. It's such an important component of aftercare, as we all know. So educational services have improved dramatically over the last decade, and I will say in part due to litigation brought by the Legal Aid Society, Advocates for Children, and, and the law firm of Dewey Valentine. If I could just touch on our uh, recommendations, they really echo the mayor's leadership team, so I urge you to set forth in our written testimony, I'm, I'm sure the council is aware of this report that was published in 2016, and it details extensive recommendations that address important things such as tr credit transfers for kids leaving care, middle school promotion for the overage and undercredited kids who often find themselves disengaged, and school re-enrollment options that are important to um, timely re-enrollment. And lastly, of course, it addresses um, important recommendations for children with special education needs and how they can be successfully reintegrated in their schools. Thank you again. Uh, hello. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Kevin Kuros. <coughs> excuse me. I'm a graduate student uh, finishing my master's in public administration. My research of field, my research field is disconnected youth, 
So today is my first day attending this. Thank you for having me. Uh, when I was eight years old, my parents were deported back to Colombia, subsequently leaving me and my brothers homeless. Uh, so I grew up homeless, managed to join the United States Army at age 18, and today I'm a graduate student. Uh, so I want to give back as much as I can because I'm not here as a poster child for any particular program as there was nothing around in my day uh, to support me and my brothers. Uh, three things that I want to highlight what I've noticed today is one thing I want to mention is long-term solutions. Uh, it was mentioned that they only follow up uh, four to six months, <coughs> and that's, I, I guess, like a standard in what I've been researching. And I feel that that's not enough for youth. There needs to be a longer, uh, longer solution as far as um, partnering a youth with uh, agencies and services in order to make them successful. Also, increased partnerships. I noticed <laughs> there's a lack of partnership and collaboration with agencies and nonprofits. Uh, strengthening those partnerships will be uh, a key asset to making sure our <laughs> youth are successful and to reduce the recidivism rate. Also, the lack of data. I, I, I noticed you, Mr. Chairman, asking if there's any data, if any of this is successful, and the answer was no. So <laughs> I, you know, I asked the members of the committee and the chairman that to increase the data because we need to know if these services are in fact effective. and. And not also that, but also to know exactly how to pinpoint these services as far as areas and even to know the number of youth that are being serviced because as far as the disconnected youth as a whole, there's a huge gap of services according to Jobs First in their report. There's uh, <coughs> approximately 186,000 disconnected youth and only about 34,000 receive services annually. And last but not least, uh, I know, uh, I believe the executive director of Bronx Connect mentioned that there needs to be some sort of awareness campaign. Uh, that's something that I advocate for a lot. Uh, the mayor's office has something for domestic violence, uh, mental health. So I'd like to see something as far as awareness for disconnected youth. A huge thing now because we're in <coughs> the year 2017 is uh, applications. So I'd like to see like a web application where youth can go on and see what services are around their communities. That way they could connect to them easier. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to say, uh, uh, Mr. Kuros, uh, I'm impressed. Uh, you, you didn't get to start with some people get to start in life and what you have made out of yourself and the future is smiling towards you. So we all, we all applaud you here. And not only that, you came back uh, to, to start making a difference and that's what it's all about. So Mike, uh, compliments to you since I speak to you let me just uh, ask you a question in your studies yes. have you found uh, any program nationwide that has gone beyond six months uh, and if there's any data to substantiate that after six <coughs> months we get better results or is this something that we need to start exploring because no one has done it well in my experience and research I feel there is opportunities for better tomorrow and they have a career services that follows up with youth I think up up until two years and they've seen a great success rate as far as that youth build which is a federally funded program provides um, workforce um, development to, to youth and follow-up services for up to a year so I think the year mark is a little too shy however I'm, I'm basing this off my personal experience and the youth that I've worked with um, Personally, when I went and got my high school equivalency, they followed up with me for six months. And at the time, I was working construction, and they would I would just get a phone call and say, are you alive? You know, things like that. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that was enough or sufficient. I think <coughs> we need to have a, a system where you, you have to sit down, you come in, you follow up. And also try to, I, I, the, the mention, there was a mention of fathers and being absent. <coughs> so I think a huge role to replace fathers is mentors because like personally for me, I don't have, my father wasn't around, but mentors have helped me and shaped me to the man that I am today. Well, I have to tell you this is something that when I took, um, um, when I began to share, chair this committee, it was the first uh, and the foremost agenda that I had was mentorship because mentorship is proven to work. And so we're about to, commission announced it today, and um, we're about to do some innovative work on that line. And that mentorship might be the answer uh, because it's gonna go beyond six months. Uh, that mentorship will continue for, 
for a prolonged amount of time. Absolutely. Uh, personally, I mentor three youth from Astoria Housing, and I've been mentoring them for five <coughs> years. And the mentoring program doesn't exist anymore. However, I still make time to see them, and we, we keep cutting. That's fantastic. That's awesome. Great work. I mean, to ask you about uh, who is dropping the ball uh, in terms of, did you mention two months? Uh, before the referral was made? Well, yeah, I think, I mean, I, what we're finding is that the, um, the discharge planning is, is very coordinated. There are conferences. So in, um, in terms of who is dropping the wall, it, it, it's sort of hard to really pinpoint. Um, with the example I gave, it was a, a lack of a timely referral, whether that was from the provider or the permanency placement specialist, or whether it was on the receiving end and it wasn't picked up. You know, really, they're, they're so individualized in terms of who's dropping the ball. But I think, you know, the, the, the process being highly coordinated, they bring in um, the team, you know, at, at um, regular intervals is very important to sort of prevent the ball from being dropped. But, you know, 30 days is a very long time. So if you have a conference on day 30 and on day 45, you're going to, or, you know, I'm sorry, on day, the day of discharge and then day 45, you're going to miss a lot in those first 45 Absolute, days. Absolutely. Uh, 30 days is an eternity working with uh, the youth that need at that transition that yeah. transition to take place. I, my, my jaws drop, and I'm, I'm going to follow. Are we talking about the specialists? Who, who's, who's not making this proper referral? So the specialist works in conjunction with the, um, the discharge provider, the aftercare provider. So I can't tell you exactly on, with this example without going back to look at the paperwork, but I can get you that information. Okay, I mean, please. To drill it down. And is this This the is norm? not the only example of it. Okay, I, I was going to ask tell you. That is this I have, an anomaly or is this? There is another example in our testimony, and I didn't really see the need to sort of go on and on, you know, to demonstrate the same problem, but timeliness has been a problem for, well, that we've seen. One is too many, right, uh, for that particular child. Sure. And, um, and if we, even if it's, you know, the way I look at it, it needs to happen immediately, even a week, uh, because they begin to reconnect uh, with people from their past, uh, uh, with, with peer groups that have that brought them to where they're at, and so uh, it's very important for them to you know, connect with the services and uh, and this help. I would ask uh, after we're done if you could. Uh, I'll, I'll give them a card. If you got any legislative uh, ideas, uh, you mentioned s uh, some of the ideas that you have. I would love uh, to get them and see. Um, you know, the potentiality of of introducing uh, some legislation uh, to make sure that. We, we could do this better. I'm always looking, how do we do this better? And so a critical thinking says what's wrong. Uh, creativity says how do we make it better. So I'm always looking to creative people, uh, how we can make it better. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And with that, uh, we conclude today's hearing. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. <coughs> Forgot to mention, uh, I want to give a special thanks uh, to Joshua Kinsley, a legislative counsel, and William Honkach, senior policy analyst. Without them, uh, I couldn't do this. Thank you so much.